Welcome to the Sundress Publications Reading as part of the Secluded Writers Conference. We are excited to welcome our authors, Albert Abinado, DM Spratley, Ever Jones, and Faye Hernandez today. Um, our first reader is Albert Abinado, uh, who is the author of Jaw, which was released earlier this year from Sundress Publications. He teaches creative writing at SUNY Geneseo and RIT. His poems have appeared in Boston Review, Colorado Review, The Margins, Waxwing, and others. He hosts the Flower City Yop at WAYO 104.3. 3 FM LP, and he lives with his wife in Rochester, New York. Welcome, Al. Thanks, Aaron. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming out and uh, listening. Um, it's going to be some poems from my new collection from Jaw. Uh, this is the eighth day. And on the eighth day, God said, let there be spam and white rice and a fried egg on top of all that, because God knew that shit tastes holy and the Lord always enters through the mouth first. And on the eighth day, God said, let there be fish heads too, for the neighbors who do not know how many spines you broke to get here, who believe you are an ogre for loving bones as much as you do. And on the eighth day, God said, let there be a house on Long Island with a basement full of cousins and uncles and aunts who are your aunts, only because they know how to spell your last name, and that is a blood magic too. And God said, a house isn't a house until it is full of sweat and oil, until someone forgets to pay the heating bill or the phone bill, and one half of your phone calls belongs to your ghosts. And on the eighth day, God said, who are you trying to call anyway? What do you need that you haven't already forgotten? For God declared the eighth day to be the longest, of all the days. Let the sun drag its ass back from church without tithing. And on this day, the mother God said, do not spit because we had already given up too much of our water to get here. But you spat anyway because you are named after the ocean and what you bring to the earth is a dazzling flood. And Father God took a belt to your thighs after working an overnight and the roar of the airplanes in your room had grown too loud while he slept hovered above you with his God breath still dreaming about Greece, asked you what you know about the sky, but you don't ever tell the gods that feed you how you learned to let your hands go, how to hold the sun in its place like any good God would. Uh, this is, this is the ghost group. My mother can strip the meat off any chicken bone, leave nothing but a hinge, no trace of ligament, nor evidence that what she pinches between her teeth once supported an entire architecture of feather and seed. She does not stop there, can split the bone too, suck the marrow, the sweetest part. This is how she loves, offers my father a taste until he too is sharpened by her appetites. How do they know when to stop, when the bone has nothing left to give? My family says I do not know the proper way to finish a meal, that I leave too much for others to reclaim, treat them as if they come laced with a wild poison. I have seen my mother take from my plate every discarded knot of muscle and make them into a rosary. Here is where the ghosts take root where the spirit composes itself, the blood assembling in places light is the most absent. I watch my mother work the last scraps, shape her mouth into something so nimble it can make ribbons from the smallest nerve before breaking it. This is how to unbend the tongue. Amazing. The tongue that resists dirt and gravity with prayer. My mother says, my mother asks me to teach her how to say sty and hippopotamus as if she confronts daily a glut of filth and dangerous rivers. How do you unbend the tongue? I tried once to learn Tagalog, reciting a catalog of phrases into the compressed air of my car hold conversation with a hollow man whose silence provides its own lessons. What I want is to be obscene among relatives, to say blood and dick with sincerity. 
My mother told me she could not teach me this. A brain consumes one life at a time, then bursts. And still, I hear how she grieves with my aunts, her mouth full of dust and rice and ditches with wide-jawed fish that swallow children whole, that make limbs into shadows of limbs. This is how you say hippopotamus, a rifle wild in the mouth, rain against corrugated tin, weather that ends with hissing. It's kind of weird because it's like also quiet. Uh, this is grandfather as a boy beneath the floor. Uh, just a little thing you need to know about this poem. Um, I use a phrase, and I hope I'm saying it properly, tiktalaok, um, which is the Tagalog way of saying kakadulu. Grandfather as a boy beneath the floor. Their footsteps were an alphabet I did not understand as I waited below where my father told me to stay when the Americans came to be quiet or they will find me and fill my head with voices. Because I did not want to have conversations with myself, I waited for them to leave. They who my mother said have mouths full of serpents. What did I know about the language of invertebrates? What words did they have for which orchid lizard? I listened to how the mouth can be its own animal expected snakes to fall from them and find me hiding in the dirt so they could strike my heel or thigh. I could have taught these snakes to catch rats instead, how to retrieve eggs without swallowing. The only snakes I knew lived in trees where these men must have fallen from. They must have been the same tall men with red eyes I've caught looking into my room at night. I have heard them swallowing chickens before I sleep. When they came trying to convince my father I should follow them, the heads of roosters were still in their jaws. What is the sound of a boy in the dark? Tik till ok. And where am I on? Okay. This is America tries to remove a splinter. Don't worry, this will be quick. My thumb on your palm your thumb on my neck, neck, my wrist, quick, like your father, like your mother. Everything is. A shark is, a wolf is, quick. I have done this once or twice. Trust me, if you do not have faith, most ghosts are the color of grease. My hands feels, my hand feels like a flame I put through your hair. I can clip the ends of your toes until they are clouds. Thank you for your patience, which is unnecessary. Listen to me when I say, you do not need to move. You do not need to breathe. Put your hand on my hip. I swear a quickness, it will be over and you will thank me. You will not notice how I have put my hands inside your bones, which are hollow, which are your father, your mother. I have your hand on, your, on my palm. How does this feel, the weight of a shark? Your patience is rainwater. I have never seen hands like these. Do not move. When I say I am quick, I mean, look up. The sky is not quick, but sad and still. This is self-portrait as a wisdom tooth. Should this be proof that I have become something other than myself? more than a stone that crowds close to the throat and its clap of obscenities. A point furthest from a kiss, a jaw left afraid to clamp down on any sweetness, to bend or grind meat into salt. Then let the head shatter each time I collide against myself, recoil from my ghostly hum. I do not own the blood that passes beneath me, but I threaten its alignment the mouth and its horoscope, root every thread of gossip. Let me carry into the brain a new wilderness, deer that shed their antlers in inconvenient fields. I know the skull possesses its own starlight. I know what poisons permit some to sleep, that rot can be the same word for sugar, that extraction means to break without apology, to say you were never meant to be in this place. 
I'm just going to end on this last poem. Hopefully, you know. And this is a uh, luxury. Today, I do not think about death, not the brittle skulls of children or the metal in their blood that passes for bullets. I do not think about the bones of birds or the blackberry seeds left in the belly, the time a muscle takes to go blue from a deflated lung, not the bright jaws of insects that come for the flesh, the meat. I do not think of grief as a color on my aunt's tongue, her face a country of fires. I do not think about kissing my grandfather in his coffin, not the temperature of his lips. Today, I lose count. Forget about sorrow and its teeth, regret and its prickled skin. How to pray for the dead I do not have to bury. That hymns turn my mouth into a sun. That terror can be the same word for skin or brain. Forget I do not have to, do not speak Chinese or have to correct anyone who asks if I speak Chinese. Say, no, I am afraid I am Filipino. Say, I do not speak Tagalog either. I do not ask anyone to forgive me for forgetting, and this is the oldest joy. Let me forget that I cannot hold the moon to feed it peppers when I want, that the rain in the trees is not a rapture and applause for the rose on my shoes, that I do not blister and crack from holiness. Today, I am holy, and when I split my lip on the fist of my brother that was holy too, and when I kneel in the center of an empty parking lot, I do so grateful I can taste my blood. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Ah, it's such always such a joy to hear you read. Um, our next reader uh, is DM Spratley. DM Spratley is a mixed race, flat, queer, Southern poet. Her poems have appeared in Poetry, 32 Poems, Shenandoah, Drunken Boat, and the Lambda Literary Poetry Spotlight, among other journals. She has received awards from the North Carolina Arts Council, Princeton University, and Rattle. Her poem, Each Morning an Animal, won the 2020 Sundress Publications Broadside Contest, and she is currently at work on a full-length poetry manuscript and fiction project, and her microchat book, Some Tricks I Was Born Knowing, is forthcoming from Ghost City Press in August 2020. Welcome, Dan. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm so excited to be doing this and I appreciate all the folks who are um, watching. I'm so excited to be in what feels like a little private reading with three wonderful poets. Um, and I am home in North Carolina um, with my partner and our two dogs. And I want to say that if you hear barking in the background, um, that is Cedar and she's very angry, um, but she also loves you. And so I wasn't gonna start with this poem, but she's been a little riled up in the background. Um, and this poem features cedar. Uh, it's bitter root, blood root, dog tooth rue, and blood root is also the title of my manuscript in progress. My mother dies and time buckles underneath me. By next spring, even the dog has forgotten how to hike, her nose intent on discovering other dogs that have come before her. The forest sweeps in front of her unrequested, an afterthought born on mud. The season has grown impatient with us and pushes spring ephemerals against our feet. Heal, I say, but the dog will not, straining in her harness, nose already blooming brown with dirt. each morning an animal. It is not the country here, but still, each morning, an animal spread out for the road like faith. Somewhere, someone steps into her coveralls and heads out to carry it home in the flat lap of a shovel. The land will have us when the land wants us, the animal body screams. Many times, minutes after meeting, I pulled someone's screaming body to my own. But once, after years of what we might call friendship, if we were watching from a distance, I went home with you. We knelt before one another's bodies, fools looking for beauty. 
believing we'd found beauty in our common bodies. I felt nothing, not even when you pressed me down into the mattress and braid my name. My God, how I preferred a stranger, the frank exertion of their work. That was in the mountains where animals lost themselves often in the city. Now my thoughts rise earlier in the morning than my body where pain has flown in and built a nest and found a mate and fluttered in whatever pain feels. Is it pleasure when it lays? I read that poem at a university and um, was very nervous about reading a poem that had sex in it, like any kind of reference to sex, especially in front of young people. Um, and I made a big deal about it as I started. And at the end, everyone was like, I don't even like, we have no idea what you're talking about. You're a poet. <laughs> Be explicit. So um, I'm glad I get to read it for y'all. This is Disappearing Act. His sisters boil yams, watching air, like salmon, furrow the water. There are ways of telling someone is becoming smaller and our mother wrinkles her forehead full of shadows, patterns, tea leaves in the shape of a fist. This is not what we've been waiting for this whole week. Sweet potato spout smell bleeding through the rooms and his mother, Ella, spread across the couch like soft cheese. This is not our father rupturing doorways, ones we never knew were there, tucked behind the fridge and hidden by a curtain of ivy. Not him saying, look, and us searching his pockets for hard candies. Butterscotch clacks against Ella's teeth and her voice climbs the swollen tunnel of her throat. It burns me up, she said, and for years I'd picture her with P.T. Barnum, hair pulled tight as a checkered dress she might have worn, mouth caverned to accept the fire. What she wore. It was black and it was short. It was a short skirt. It was the light from street lamps, and sometimes it wasn't. It was light flashing from each passing car. Sometimes it was dark. It was a fast walk. It was the warm air. She wore the air. She wore the weather, getting better and better. It was bare like weather, and really, it wore her. It was the men. She wore a garland of their eyes. She wore her very best mouth, bright and open. She wore her teeth around her ankles. When she walked, they cackled. She wore it well. It was a fast walk. It was her skin. It was on her skin, needled into her skin. She wore her skin all over. Sometimes it was light. She couldn't stop wearing her skin. So I, um, I read the first poem featuring Cedar, um, Who Loves You, but that's about um, the time after my mother died. And this is um, a little bit later. Um, and it is, that's a big running theme in um, the work that I'm doing now is exploring kind of legacy and family and the death of both of my parents. Um, so this is called The Collector of Debts. Though she's been gone two years now, these people still dig up my mother's name from their mounds of debt to be collected. The payday loan rep is persistent as mint in a garden, as in, you must be her daughter then. I beg his pardon. I say you are speaking to her ghost because it makes him stutter. No doubt he pictures my mother smirking into the phone. Inside me, a haint bubbles with laughter. We are neither of us wrong. The haint and I sit on the couch and cradle the dog, his hot breath rising and his belly hoping the ceiling will reach down to pet it. We've set the phone aside and the lender crackles through, his mouth a loop of ecstatic tongues, 
a list of things we no longer own and which he says he plans to take from us. What else we purr once the house is gone so that his voice grows dull with spit and shame? The haint and I pat the dog's head delightedly with the selfsame hand. Yes, let's call us one. For when the haint crossed the threshold of this home in spite of the sage I burned, the garlic anchored in every doorway, every eye open to the world, she fit herself inside me. Perfect fit, hand in glove. So when she pats the head of the dog, he sways like a dancer, giddy from our touch. When she feeds him, he tumbles at our feet and asks for more. When she lowers my soul into the well of sleep, he lies beside our body and he doesn't dream of her sins and she doesn't dream at all. And I dream that she shouts my name from the bottom of an impossible gorge, the bottom noisy and inscrutable with chatter. She tells me to throw a rope down into the din for her escape from the land of the dead where I could get pulled in. But when she calls, I answer. So I'll read two more. Um, this is at mass. My grandmother lights a candle for my body. My grandmother watches me eat stuffed dates. We call this the body because it dissolves and reappears. I stuff dates into each of my cheeks. Food, like the body, tastes sweet when soft. My grandmother takes the dates and rests them on the rot in the trash can. We call this the body because a hungry animal moves between us. We feed her or she starves. At dusk, I ride my bicycle north and the island keens beneath me, singing verses from the Book of the Dead. It shows me where the erosion starts. Here, at the jawbone of Drawbridge. Here, where a curve of sand receives the bay. Each day, the island urges me forward. Each day, I leave and I return. Peace be with me. Who gave us this language? We call this the body because it makes us holy. We call this the body because it blisters. My wick burns its petition on the altar. It calls and calls this body. The island breaks the day against itself like bread. When the island has been worn to ocean floor, where will the day be consumed like this, split open? And who will witness? Um, so y'all have probably seen me smiling in between these poems, and that's because there um, is so much support going on on the full screen view, which is what I'm looking at. Um, so big appreciation to y'all. Um, <laughs> and so excited for more. Um, this is my last one. This is the road over Catawba Mountain. The road over Catawba Mountain is jealous of the roads surrounding Catawba Mountain. The roads at its feet birth houses and little gas stations made of diesel pumps and beef jerky. People who walk those roads or hustle bicycles over them or stand planted in front of a duffel bag, thumb climbing at a car's approach, are rarely looking for a way onto the road over Catawba Mountain. They do not venture that far without the sheen of metal harnessed around their bodies and even then they never loiter. The few houses clinging to the base of the road over Catawba Mountain might as well be gutted for all the road seas of their occupants. They might as well be filled with the forgotten, the never born, the never asked for, the dead. If ever these people or ghosts leave home, they are only going to call upon other roads and fill their vehicles with diesel and beef jerky. The road over Catawba Mountain feels the vibration of 60 tires shimmying up its back each day. That is 15 cars, and inevitably, one will carry a man who will pull over near the top so he can hold himself in his hand and shoot piss across the landscape like a star. If you are one of those men, the road would like you to know 
It is okay. There is nothing wrong with that. There are less dignified things to do on a mountaintop and few that feel more urgent. And for that day, you become a precious word in the mouth of the road over Catawba Mountain, your name cycling through its body. Joe, 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 it says, or Magnus, Magnus, Magnus. This is the way ex-lovers think of you, if you were any good. This is the way your mother will sing your name in grief if you should die before her. This is the way the road over Catawba Mountain remembers your body, the muscles and fat and tendons that were once so close, for it misses you, for its hold on the earth is tenuous and it knows you are out there somewhere living. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, I'm very excited about the the uh, broadside as well as our pre-orders for the chat book out yet. Um, they aren't out yet. Um, I'm sorry. Were you asking oh, me? Oh yes. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> they aren't out yet, um, but they will be on August fourth. Um, so you can find them on their site. Yes. And it's Ghost City Press. Yes, it is. Yeah. Thank. You. Awesome. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Our uh, next reader uh, is Ever Jones. Ever Jones is a queer trans writer, painter, and instructor living in Seattle, Washington. Their newest collection, Night Song, is now out from Sundress Publications, and it is a trans liberatory lyric of politics, nature, and identity. They've published two other poetry collections, Wilderness Lessons from Future Cycle, and a chapbook, Primitive Elegy from Alice Blue Books. They teach poetry and creative nonfiction writing at the University of Washington in Tacoma and are an instructor at the Richard Hugo House. Their essays and poetry can be found at Poetry, Tupelo Quarterly, Poecology, uh, Bellingham Review, Terrain.org, Cimarron Review, Columbia Poetry Review, and others. Welcome, Ever. I can't give you too long of a bio. I'm sorry, Erin. Um, this is so much fun. Um, I, I wish we had like a, an hour long Q&A so we could all just kind of sit and talk to each other. Um, and I just love that I'm with so many press mates. Um, I've been wondering like who's with me and I think Faye, isn't your book on pre-order right now? Do you have your proof yet? I can't wait. I hope you show us the cover. Um, and Jaw, do you have the cover to Jaw with you? It's so pretty. Yes. It's an amazing book. Um, I really wanted you to show it because it's like the best pink I've ever seen. And your reading in AWP and today are so beautiful. And um, I'm just such a fan of all of you already. And I'm just happy to be here. Um, I thought I'd read a newer poem since this is, a, I think this is like a secluded, right? That's the name of this conference. And so I, I have a poem here called Lip Syncing in Quarantine. So I thought I would start um, with our conference title kind of thing. Um, and I just wondered, are, in, are any of you like really in your heart Whitney Houston fans who I'm reading with today? Just like you feel it? Me too. And I accidentally was lip syncing to a Celine Dion song and I just felt so much shame. It's <laughs> not shame, but like, what am I doing? So this is uh, Lip Syncing in Quarantine. In my darkest nightmare, I write a poem about Celine Dion, whose question about silent hearts and the basic gratitude for being loved moved me greater than a sinking ship in the 90s. It's not the reach of her voice or her career's insistence on the confessional lyric or how she's dramatic like meatloaf, but without the boundary stating, I won't do that. I'll do anything except love you, a truly dick-obsessed song rooted in masculine colonial punishment. Instead, the nightmare is that somehow Whitney's spirit will hear my soul stir in the general lack contained in Celine's voice, her reliance on emptiness and loss to drive any emotion at all. She could hold a breakup forever in her dramatic, trying voice, every emotion, a break uh, Every, every motion picture's death sank to the iciest of deaths when she sang it. Meanwhile, Whitney sits balls out in a hardback chair during the highest moment of her career. The bodyguard flashbacks nowhere near enough to hold her as she transitions to an empty stage in an empty theater, 
embodying enough aliveness to fill it with a simple gaze that insists and joys and calls out in a moment. She wears a smart jacket, attends to a split second of eye contact, and changes the world with a fullness we will still reckon with trying to bear. See, the difference is that Whitney taught us how to love, not lose. When in 2000 she said, I will be free, I will fill eternity, she ushered a planet of people into a century. So when I lip sync during quarantine to Celine asking to be touched again by a lover, asking for a nostalgic circumstance to bring the past to the present, I apply my skills of depth and connection from the greatest love of all, a song asking us to love ourselves, because though she got sold to the pop gods, she always knew the world wouldn't see her, that white people would reduce her to a few songs, and black people would watch white people turn her almost purple when she wanted to dance with somebody. I remember her sinking in a hotel bathtub as a titanic event that showed America a shame it still cannot understand. I just think of Whitney Houston all the time. Once a year, I go on YouTube and just like alter and, and honor her and just like watch everything I can find and like have a good cry. And, um, I, I feel like she taught me a lot when I was a kid. The poem is an origin of burning stillness, fire around the hemlock's branch, which if you look closely is a crystal burnished by water and wind, an eye in earth's subterranean. Looking through it, I wonder which piece of me is suspended there looking back from the original, whose knowing is so simple, so elemental, the poem folds its wings to hear it. We are too young a species to forget seizure by ocean, seizure by earth, seizure by fire, seizure by wind. Too young not to lean into our ancestors' whispers between the dimensions of our addictions. The problem is that a poet wants to save everything while it all falls down around us until Rilke says we fall apart ourselves. But what if a poem is a fossil? in the rising star cave or Walmart, our origin, a dimensional luminary the poem takes us to. Recently, a super new moon changed the maps again. We awoke to new continents and saw eelgrass as mystic, sea cucumber as a well for wishes we couldn't yet name but somehow knew. We saw the moon rise in its waters as a fountain of stars sprang from its throat, and we said, God, that we could no longer understand its meaning. Um, those poems are from a manuscript in progress called The Unraveling, which I'm working on and um, really trying to get into um, some, some more ancestor work and um, working towards like, understanding um, how, to, how to really use present and past together in a really meaningful way. So it's a lot of fun. Um, the book that is coming out like tomorrow-ish, Erin, or in, the, in a day or two or something, three, um, is called Night Song. This is a book that I wrote. Um, I started it uh, at the beginning, when the Pulse uh, nightclub shooting happened and, and keep going with the book until Barack Obama's last day in office. And it was just a really cool time, terrible time by cool. I just mean, there was so much going on and um, I really feel the way this book um, reaches into the present moment too. And um, so I, I kind of, I kind of love books as like these time pieces of what's happening in our lives, what's happening in our national lives and um, just kind of, always kind of throwing that knotted rope into the past. Um, so I'll just read a couple from here. Um, nighttime in the greenhouse is a riot of flowers painting love letters for sky and earth. Here I am a roadside spectator in another's cathedral. When the knife, or were they shears, sever the body for another grocery store bouquet. Shall we see this as grave? 
noun, an excavation in the earth, a mound, a digger, a secret. Adjective, grave questions, grave errors, grave news. Verb, to dig, to excavate, to bury, to hide, to swallow up. Shall we set a hyphen in our rotational value of being? When she said, I will fight tooth and nail, did she remember the blood in our teeth? The silent chambers of hearts and vulnerable, vulnerable jugulars seized from every paycheck? Or is this her seas in a world so spun every heart is an enemy? At the flower shop, a white father and son select an exceptional, exceptional bouquet for mom. They're dressed in full camouflage, desert meets forest meets jungle meets America meets war. The pattern is tooth and nail, pockets roomy enough for every extinction, each genocide attempt. See the grave trenches honored with wildflowers. If I could, I'd drop this poem into the boy's pocket, but I fear he'd kill me for my gender resistant body, for the gentle touch of the unknown that he will never be allowed to be. My pen tip is a claw, a nail, and I admit that I jab myself every day for the admittance of my body. The violence of non-gender and the safety of white skin, a heart chamber seals and releases, seals and releases. Did you know that a tusk is a tooth? An incisor for shadowing the lands, grasses, trees. I think that teeth have memory in the electric circuit of their nerves, that nails are graves for the dead, continuously reimagining the matrix of being alive. I am trying to write about shootings, you see, but the animal body, but the animal body. A tusk lacks enamel, pearly versus ivory, but has growth rings around the blood, around the original memory. I think that's what I mean to say about tenderness. I think that's what I mean to say about power. When I was a girl, night told me to bite or burn. My ass was a cat call, my face a baby, my hips a handle, my body's object turned skin to ash. When I was a girl, I was a pearl gathering itself from dust, a word song waiting in a shell. How can I tell you that your eyes are commas in my obituary, where every cathedral is a stranger? That every time you argue my grammar after tracing my breasts from moon into tit, or citing the manual of singulars and plurals, my spirit folds its syntax into a choke. Dear silence, wing muscle pulls down the air's stars, opening each throat in the meadow. Dear silence, wing song releases the throats of the dying until each sound is a resting place for gods. Dear silence, we burn too brightly for the boundaries of nouns. Most days, we give it all up to be a fire. And I think I uh, will finish with this poem. I'm really excited to hear um, Faye's work. Um, and this is the last poem in the book. Somewhere behind us is every nature endlessly cradling the thorns of our bodies. A green wave in the gray ocean or the particular mist binding cells into a holy ground of flowers. Sometimes we speak to ourselves in flowers, erupting morning wisdoms, whispering there there now, these wounds. Of wounds I know little more than the gaping heart of my throat, the persistent swallowing of my tongue and the milk of pain from my country. But of fog I know the dissolution of edges and how that Appalachian mountain broke into a pallet of stars each morning. I know all of this that can pen the poem to, into the present, into pollen, a save, salve for the liberation I see ahead of me in the shape of stars and throats. Thank you all so much.
Thank you so much, Ever. And yes, uh, by the time that this reading is live, uh, Night Song will be available at all of your local and online retailers. So <laughs> yeah, uh, so I'm very excited for our final reader tonight, Faye Hernandez. Faye Hernandez is an Inglewood raised immigrant, trans, non-binary, visual artist, writer, and healer. Faye is an advisory board member of Gender Justice Los Angeles and was one of the artists for the Forward Together's 2019 Trans Day of Resilience campaign. They are a co-founder of the ING Fellowship, which provides member mentorship to Inglewood youth for working on projects to counteract gentrification and was also a fomenter for the 2019-2020 Seeds of Liberacion Leadership Development Program for Young Transgender, Gender Nonconforming, and Intersex People in Los Angeles. Hi, Kat. Uh, <laughs> They are a certified uh, Reiki and Akashic uh, Records practitioner who utilizes a decolonial approach to ancestral energetic healing. Their debut collection, Hood Creatora, is now available to pre-order from Sundress Publications. Welcome, Faye. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really, really grateful to have this opportunity, um, also just to have a book in general. like. Um, you know, for me, writing has always been my protest, has been my way of claiming space that I uh, damn well deserve and that my people deserve. And so, you know, to just have a book now in the flesh, it just feels like a new, a, you know, my, my firstborn, my newborn, and, and to be able to share in this intimate way and with everyone else here uh, joining us today, it just means the world. So I'm gonna start with a couple pieces that I um, that I tend to perform live. Um, they're adaptions to the written pieces in the in the manuscript. So I hope y'all enjoy. America with three K's instead of a C. You're a gardener without a backbone. You picked immigrants, planted their black and brown hands in farms, picking and growing and rotting for you. Yet y'all call us illegal. When mommy and I immigrated to this country, she taught me that little things were actually really big things. So the garage where floor was bed became a mansion of imagination where my mother was also my father, where Spanish was a Bible that erased all struggle and the nine digit branding me citizen was non-existent. You see, I've always been oblivious to the alien people sought in me until opportunities were blank. Like the social security line I couldn't fill in, never turned in like my vote in an election, but before I got crazy and burned this motherfucking nation down, mommy taught me patience. She said, baby, it's the spirit's way. Growing up, mommy never let my bare feet touch ground. You see, she knew friends whose brothers, daughters, and sisters died with blistering feet under a blistering sun crossing the border. Mommy taught me how to swim. It was her simple way of erasing the bitter taste of dead bodies from tongue. You see, they call us immigrants wetbacks because my people never lifted from the pits of the Rio Grande. Fabi, speak up, talk louder. She didn't want my voice to recede to the sound of a whisper or become silent like statistics. So she said, baby, in your body, one body all will stand. And yes, they do, mommy. Yes, they do. And we ain't going anywhere. We ain't going anywhere. We ain't going anywhere. So that's my first piece. Um, my second piece is titled Reason Men Build Walls. Um, you know, bug boys. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is the piece. I hope y'all enjoy it. My lover fears me. I guess there's too much Selena in my walk, too much Frank Ocean in my loving. I guess I'm too much storm in the summer hold. Nah, I'm too much sugar on the tongue. I'm too much spirit. I'm too many ancestors in a room. To that hetero flexible fuckboy that swore he loves me, I'm a threat. These beautiful soil brown eyes are pending earthquakes, a possession. These lips are wild detour, wild harvest, and this love is a caution sign. It is a red light. He's clearly not used to the ways of the earth, the way my lovin' can swoop him in one touch like wind. He is not used to a transient love like sound bath or universe energy. He is not used to the howling woman on my tongue, not used to myth being truth. Of course, I'm a threat. He's a colonizer that fears the Pima Indian in me, the eagle, the flight, the ritual of me. He fears the too bare earth child, the too savage in me, the too taramara in me, the too masculine female combine, the too healer and warrior in me. And he tried to sever me, 
slice me with his love like a colonial silver sword, but with my too much Selena in my walk, too much Frank Ocean in my love and being too much storm in the summer, I broke a fragile masculinity. This trans body is a reason why men build walls, borders on their fingertips. I am the reason why men don't cry, don't open up to men. This queer body will always be danger, a disease, a howling spirit, awakening, 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 and God forbid I awaken a man. But if mommy taught me one thing, it's that I am the reason why silence is the only way men know how to love. Thank you. Um, so now I'm gonna be reading some poetry from the collection um, verbatim. Um, these are not adapted pieces. Before this, the title of this piece is Before Being Flung on the Telephone Wire. God don't give a fuck about me. She doesn't care that in this poem, my red van symbolize my uterus. She still hurls them onto the telephone wire. When people ask me where I'm from, I say a black line shooting through a blue sky. My womb is a plastic bag stuck on the telephone wire. The breeze don't change direction where I'm from, so I stay stuck. God can be in a long white robe crop top and sagging jeans or be a naked Coatli Cubri incarnate, but she still don't give a fuck that my womb is a knot where both shoes meet. She doesn't care that I'll cling between earth and blue without a ladder tall enough to reach me. I grew up here on the fine line between man and woman, penis and translucent womb. I am the symbol that marks the dead, a tombstone made out of vans that don't bleed, they just hang. This crucifixion is God's divine elaborate joke for bodies like mine, always at war with themselves. God be like, just toss them in the air and see what they do. She grips her stomach, points at me and laughs. She wants people to see me nails in palms so that they can see themselves too. See the black line between sky and dirt, man and woman that keeps us in this dance of two. I am what she envisages, my palms and feet nailed to a cross, a mirage showing me, showing the world we're all mid-flight somewhere, heading to our destination. Thank you. And then um, I'll read two more. Um, I'm scrolling through them real quick. Um, this one's one of my favorite pieces. Um, it's about my mom's office in Inglewood. Um, just, you know, like I see her as this epicenter to my life. She's literally the heart of my manuscript. Um, and this piece is just like, you know, my little cute self being a kid and growing up in her office and what it means for her as an undocumented woman to have an office now. It's called First Real Nation of Nations. Mommy's business beaming with people, wearing all kinds of bright yellows and greens, bustling with song, their voices filling every crux of stillness assumed in a tax office. Some clientes sound like a colibri's whisper. Others had crows in their cackle. Some smacked gum, jaw all sideways, while others eye rolled because they was bougie. Had a house in Inglewood, they was one of those, but we all still aspired to be them, no shade. Some had just landed off a plane, walked or kicked dirt, rode a mountain bike or swam to make it to 532 West Arborvitae Street, Inglewood, California, 90301, where my body from my toes to my clavicle was full of rich music under fluorescent strips of light, where mommy, hair like light, hands of Sololoi, was an angel incarnated into an immigrant woman sitting on a throne of leather, was a goddess of first class, was everyone's mother, Lorenzana services where everyone bowed in her presence, admired the way she typed old keys faster than a bullet, untethered, where my mom was a president of all things IRS and filling out forms with million of tiny empty boxes. She was a queen of chisme who talked with hands tossed in the air and laughter when she couldn't speak English. Mommy is a president of gifting water bottles to thirsty clients after their journey to 532 West Arbor Vita Street, where her office was like the original outdoor farmer's market before we had those in Inglewood. Except instead of papaya in vendors' hands, it was W-2s and best bargain plastic bags filled with tangled receipts for accounting. This small universe, the first real nation of all nations whose dominant language is a hug, colliding skins, or unlocking the air of freedom trapped in a bomb-ass refund. Some of her citizens brought the office plates of food, asked for me, how is Fabi's, her child prophet? I sat in the corner of her office, star-eyed. 
This was the North Star people followed. The map God placed before all peoples. I stuffed my cruiser bike basket with stacks of pink, yellow, and blue flyers I made on a free computer, boldly reading Lauren's Honor Services, subtitled Tax Season, over a picture of mommy's office front door. Stormed out, all of my people waved goodbye as I, the president's daughter, took the streets and waved flyers like a flag across the neighborhood, filling people's mailboxes and flashing my big teeth at the pedestrians of my hood to come, come to this nation. There's free hugs and, and come to this nation. You can drink shots of joy and really rest. And my mom's super nice. This nation, this warm customer service is real and it's on Arbor Vita just down the street. Thank you. And then um, I'll just read one more because that one was kind of lengthy. Um, what do I want to do? I know which one. Um, thank you all for, again, having me and being here, um, holding space and bearing witness to this because this shit's important, you know? All these stories. I'm like, I wrote this book because I didn't see it anywhere else. I'm like, I need to write these stories so i'm you know anyone who's listening who hasn't written their book write your book <laughs> um sorry i'm having trouble finding it um i'm close um sorry but this is like the perfect one that like, I feel like I need to close with. Um, here it is. Dressing Myself Mommy. This song is not an analogy about mommy's miscarriage. It's not about her guilt, working strenuous hours, leaving me with grammar equations alone. This unresolved story is not about the man she wept for that left us in a foreign country alone without syntactic competency for a new language or dinero. This prophecy is not about her clinic abortion after the wind mysteriously left her impregnated with my father's second child. I had to do it, amor. I couldn't take care of you and your brother and me and me in a new country all alone. This proclamation is about how I pretend myself to be a bearer of children or tatarabuela with a long line of progeny. These words are how I document the way I mourn for a rounder belly filled with the zygote who will live and become a toddler who will fill the walls of my home with laughter and scribbles on the floor that says, I love you, mommy. These couplets are about my uterus walls, how they open and I glide out, how every day as a perpetual flushing that won't come back, me slipping from me. Sometimes I wish I could conjure my dreams into reality the same way I write stories. If I could, I would script a uterus to glow towards me, halo, angels singing and awe, how I would reach for it and stuff it into my chest and believe in God again and how from my chest children would fly out like doves. This obituary is about how I want to be a mother, but a whole body is at war with me. Pero aún, I don't know a formula to make me a better daughter though, because I'm out here unbearing all of mommy's secrets to create a telenovela out of the trauma she suffered simply to immortalize us in a country that never wanted us, remembered in the fabric of its history. Maybe I want to carry the bricks lumped on my mom's shoulder to know what it's like to be a house, a mother, anything but this male bodied cage I wear her heartbreak, use her red lipstick and outline my eyes with black wings like I'm not already some kind of funeral all on my motherfucking own, wishing and wishing I was woman enough. I'll never be an ama, never be woman enough, only an aside. But even on my loneliest nights, singing the songs of the mothers before me, even when I steal from my own mother without citation, she places her arms around my broad shoulders and with a wide smile on her face says, mi vida, Everything that's mine has always been yours, including the woman inside of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faye. I'm so excited about this collection and I cannot wait for it to be 
tangible in the world here very shortly. So um, thank you to, to all of our readers. Seriously, thank you for your time today. Thank you for sharing your work. Um, and you can find out more about everybody. Uh, I'm guessing on this page that you are watching this on, as well as on the uh, Sundress Publications website. Thank you to, again, to all of our readers and thank you to everybody who joined in today. Uh, we really appreciate you and are looking forward to hopefully doing this again soon. So, and maybe even outside of Zoom, many chance. So, <laughs> all right, thank you all again. I really appreciate it. Have a wonderful evening.